there, and welcome to Communicating Circularity, Getting the Message Right. My name is Catherine Gretzinger. I'm a Vancouver journalist. I teach journalism at the University of British Columbia. And for an awfully long time, um, I've been thinking about environmental issues, climate, uh, biodiversity, and certainly issues around a circular economy. In Vancouver, we like to use the language of zero waste. So I help out with a conference there, and I'm so happy to have been invited to help out with the World Circular Economy Forum. And I'm particularly happy in this moment because I have the pleasure of introducing Alice Irene Whitaker. She is the Director of Communications for the Smart Prosperity Institute. She's also the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Natural Step Canada, where she leads communications for Circular Economy Leadership Canada. She's also a writer, she's a researcher, and she's writing a book on circular living. She might be a little bit busy, but we've got her all to ourselves for the next 45 minutes, and we're so pleased about that. Hi. Hi, Catherine. It's so great to be here with you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, it's really struck me over the last uh, 10 years or so since we've been talking quite forcefully about the circular economy and zero waste waste and so on, that there seem to be some challenges communicating specifically about what do we mean by a circular economy. From a marketing point of view, somebody who does comms for a living, what's your take on this? Why is it so important to get these messages right? That's a great question and there is such complexity in the circular economy. There are so many connections. You have the system and then you have the individual and you have many different parts. And that complexity sometimes means that what gets lost are the stories. So there are, there's so much power in stories. They move us all. It doesn't matter if we're a policymaker, a decision maker, a business leader, a passionate citizen. We're all human at the end of the day and it's those stories that stick out and can actually move us to care about this and become involved in it in whatever way we can with our own power or place or position. So, so those stories for me are really what, what is missing up till now, and, but what, that's the opportunity too, is to tell those stories. So how do you figure out what those stories ought to be and then go ahead and, and share those? Yeah, for me, it, I mean, of course it depends on who the audience is or you know, we all receive information in different ways. Uh, but for me, you know, there's so much evidence and fantastic research out there, but the stories to me that have stood out are you know, when I'm researching my book, when I'm in a, the home of a building who's using waste materials as insulation in his home or in a field with a shepherd who she's were surrounded by her flock of sheep and she's talking about her relationship to the soil and to the system we're in right now while we're sitting there just surrounded by her farm for me those personal stories those people and what they're going through and how they're contributing to this are the stories that need to be told as an entry point to all of the rich nuance and information that we all have right. is there a way to scale that though because of course people can relate to the individual the singular the intimate story about someone's backyard or the shoes that they choose to wear or, but to scale that and have people start to think more broadly about the ways in which economies flow and the ways in which we think about things in a more circular fashion. Yeah, so for that, I think it's really about, like we're gonna talk about today, getting the message right and saying, okay, so if this person is, what are their values? What are their beliefs? How am I going to move them? If they're coming from a place where their value set is around the economy of this and the economic story, then that's the story you start with. If that's something that uh, for one's audience isn't going to resonate, we don't talk about it. And the beautiful part of this is we all have a role to play, not just the communicators who do bring so much expertise and skill to this from other work that we can learn from but it's also the scientists it's the faith and community leaders it's people throughout a business it's people in their own neighborhoods so wherever someone is we're all messengers and so that's how we're going to reach different people is who they trust and what their values are it's interesting for you to be thinking about um, whose job it is in that way because it puts the onus on everyone it doesn't sort of center it in one place so how do you communicate that message that if you're doing something, whether you're a company or an NGO or a government, um, it's actually on you to share what you know so that it might be of service to someone else? I love that because it, you know, people don't need to have communicator or communications in their title or be a leader to have a very important role to play in this. Uh, so I think moments like this are terrific for that, but I think it's through conversation, it's through uh, 
you know, people in a company, for example, talking to each other and saying, this is the direction we're going. This is why I'm excited about the circular economy. Uh, this is what the potential is. And really seeing this as a positive rallying vision, you know? So we have uh, a lot of times in our environmental rhetoric, it's very, uh, you know, it's either focused on perfection or a lot of times it's talking about what we don't want, decarbonized or zero waste, like you were saying, which are so critical and absolutely a part of the circular economy. But what the opportunity we have here with the circular economy is a positive rallying vision that we can all create. It doesn't matter who we are. People are a little bit tense about this stuff though because there is that sort of knowledge, the fact that we have a climate emergency to contend with. And so people are saying, well, we're, we shouldn't be talking about messaging when we actually need to be taking action. So how do you reconcile that and just make sure that whatever is being shared is on point and actually addressing the issues at hand? That's uh, the, the message is needs to lead to a call to action always, right? And you're so right that it has to link to the pressing issues that we're facing, these crises, multiple crises that we're facing, uh, that if we sort of silo circular economy off and don't connect it to that, it's not relevant. And it is so connected. So telling that story, but in our messages, calling people to action, calling them in and saying, and here's what we need to do. And there's a place for you here. That's what the, why, why getting those messages right and leading to the call to action is so instrumental. Right. I'm just really thinking a lot about the last session that we had with the Inuit leader, Nathan Obed, just saying we need to share and collaborate, share and collaborate. If we could just get that piece, we might be able to shift the conversation and the, the behaviors as well. Right, and it's beautiful and that's such a, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity and it also is such a fundamental shift in our cultural story and how, you know, mainstream we're talking about how we relate to each other. So that's, uh, you know, very powerful. Well, as we're going to hear later from some of our exports, it's very important to tailor the message to the audience that you're speaking to. So I guess we should find out who's with us uh, on the line today. So let's find out from you out there watching us. And we know that we had 100,000 distinct visits just yesterday. So we don't know how many people are going to be checking us out today, but we want to know, um, why are you joining this session? What, what is it about this session that made you curious? Are you somebody who works at an NGO? Are you somebody who's in a governmental role? Are you an activist? Or what is the, the way that you're coming to this? We're going to look at the poll, and here it comes. Look at all those folks who work in the circular economy. Wow. More than half. And then again, better, better, to understand, better understanding. So people are seeking that piece that you mentioned right off the top about what is this thing called a circular economy and what does it mean? And then communications profs who, hmm, those are your people looking to sort of figure out. So what do you read in seeing those responses? I think it's tremendous seeing how many people are working in the circular economy and that you know, we see the bulk of people here are not identifying as communicators, or over half, mm -hmm. uh, but there's so much potential in each person that's had that response, or each person who's at this session, to communicate this story, even, even if not in a formal capacity. Right, right. Well, I think we're going to continue to use Slido. So right off the bat, I want to say to folks, please participate. Uh, we are going to try to knit your questions and comments and ideas in to this as we go. So Slido is very straightforward for those of you feeling a little bit nervous about it. It's a simple, quick download on your phone and then tap in the code and you're right in the session with us. And we'd love to hear from you and see what you have to contribute. So while we're waiting, we have a big plan ahead of us. I'm excited. I know. Me too, and I'm so glad that you're here with me in, in this. So we're going to kick this off with Ross Vinden. He is at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and also Rosemary Cooper from the Share, Reuse, Repair Initiative. That's an initiative based at home in Vancouver, British Columbia. So um, nice to have both of you with us. With Ross, we're going to be looking to learn more about what the foundation has learned over the last decade or so, talking about circularity. They are the reason why we're talking about the circular economy in the first place, coining that phrase. 
I'll also be looking to Ross for some tips on how to reach different audiences, whether they be investors or school kids. Then we're going to be talking to Rosemary about how to reach for different types of personalities. So to recap, first, we're going to cover how to reach people based on their job titles. Then we're going to focus on speaking with someone um, who's going to focus on personality traits. It's, uh, it sounds like a really rich conversation and uh, these are people that I admire and all of their work and looking forward to hearing these conversations. Uh, so let's get to know our audience. So we did that a little bit already. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I encourage you to use the chat function throughout the conversation. I'll be following along uh, in the chat here and I'll bring some of your points into the discussion. So please do offer them forward. Over to you, Catherine. Okay. So to start us off, I'm joined by the media and messaging lead for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. That's the organization that introduced the world to the idea of the circular economy. Hiya, Ross. Hi, Catherine. How are you doing? Great to have this time with you. Let's start at the beginning. I, I hear this question a lot. Um, in fact, even when I was telling some of my students that I was going to be coming and helping out with this, what does circular economy actually mean? And what is the point of using different language rather than talking about this as sustainability? Well, it's a, it's a nice big question for us to start with. Um, but I think it's a really good one. I think. You're right, like this question gets uh, asked an awful lot. And for me, I think it stems often from, if you looked at the, the kind of ambitions of sustainability, the things that people associate with that concept, uh, and then you look at the, the, the defined outcomes that we can achieve through a circular economy, there's clearly a lot of alignment. You know, a lot of the things that people are hoping to achieve through sustainability, we can achieve through a, a circular economy. But I think you know there are some distinctions that are probably helpful for us to to make. You know, one of them's in the in the in the name. It's a circular economy. Uh, you know, it is talking about uh, an economic model, and it's saying, you know, if today's model is based on this concept of take make waste, take a material out of the ground and turn it into a product, and then throw that away at the end of its life after a, a relatively short use, in a circular economy, we can flip that on its head and look at designing an economy that, that works on three other principles, on uh, eliminate, circulate, and regenerate. So eliminate waste and pollution, circulate products and materials, keep them in the system for as long as possible and at their highest value, and, and regenerate nature. And um, if we can design an economy to do those things, then we can lead to lots of those, those great ambitions that people have for the, the type of world we want to live in. Uh, and, and I just, Really quickly, I think that definition piece is, is also really significant. Sustainability can mean so many different things to so many different people, but what we have with circular economy is this really clearly defined approach to our economy, and it is, it is those three things, an economy designed to eliminate, circulate, and regenerate. It strikes me that if you could even get people just to move to that understanding that things that we use don't go anywhere, that we've got one planet, it's still all here. So if we can be more creative and imaginative about how to use and think about products, as you suggest, in those three ways, then that shift might make people, every time they reach for something, think about it, consider it differently. Yeah, I think that's the ambition. I think it's about changing the way, you know, we we just operate on the, on the big scale and and having a system in which we just provide people with with better choices. Actually, having a system where, you know, we move away from this idea of people as consumers and we actually think, what if there was a system in which, when we, um, you know, when we interact with a product, when we, we buy something or rent something, we can actually be part of a system that's contributing to solutions to those those big challenges. You know, 90% of biodiversity loss comes from our economic model. 45% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the way we make and use stuff. And if you think of the power of that idea that if we could shape an economy in which everyone can play a role in, in helping to solve those, those issues, it'd be such a huge positive step. Right. Some people might push back a little bit and say that, you know, the idea of consumerism is actually at the root of all of this and that that's where you want to be spending your time is working on getting people to stop 
understanding things as being consumed, um, maybe even moving to that neutral word of use or something. So how do you move away from this kind of greenwashing or messaging that allows people to be okay continuing their, their, their behaviors and, and encourage them to change their behaviors in order to sort of have that more circular approach? For me, again, it comes down to, to what we were saying about the defining things. So if we have a circular economy, it's really clearly defined for us. And that allows you to do that important job of measuring stuff and understanding and interrogating data and seeing actually, is this, is this fulfilling those kind of ambitions that we have? Is this leading to the outcomes that we want? And it, and it really relies on, on defining things. So, you know, a big part of our work is, is on making sure that people understand that definition of a circular economy and those three principles. And then we've just launched a collaboration with one of our partners, IKEA, with involvement from our other strategic partners, which is a, a glossary of terms. And the idea behind that is how do we empower the sort of understanding and, and um, shared knowledge that you need just to have really open, transparent conversations so that you can you can check for yourself and and, and say, well, is this greenwashing or is this real? Like I can I can look and say, what are you doing on those three principles? Uh, you know, how do we better understand that? I know that the foundation has spent the last decade or so talking about circularity and reaching different kinds of audiences, everyone from policymakers to little kids to investors. What have you learned in, in doing so, Ross? How, how have you um, changed your thinking about this in having those kinds of interactions you've had? I think it's a really big idea and that's really exciting, which is great news. As Alice pointed to earlier, it's very complicated and that can, that can be scary to people. But honestly, I feel like it's like any other thing that you want to communicate to people. It's really about finding the thing that they care about and, and make a connection on that point. And, and one of the, the best things about circular economy is it's systems change. So within that, you, you've got virtually every aspect of people's lives that you can talk to them about. Find you know the right examples. You know, look for the thing that's going to make it real for them, um, and then and um, make, make that connection. We're really lucky. For example, we work with with organisations as diverse as say Lego uh, and BlackRock, and you think, well, what does that open up for us? It's the chance to you know explore with with children around play and what it what they they have in their cupboard at home and how they use that and on the other side we can look and say well look this is the world's biggest asset manager what does their circular economy fund tell us about the role of investors and the future of kind of our um, financing of the transition but it's about it is about finding that connection right do, do you have a um a sense that it's catching or there's something shifting or changing at the moment I, I just listening to the discourse yesterday it it felt like there's something going on now where there seems to be more movement it's not just the same gr small group of people moving around the world to talk about this there's actually some some breadth to to the notion yeah i, I think that's true and i said well i certainly hope it's true but <laughs> What, you know, what we can see heading into COP26, for example, is circular economy becoming more present in the, uh, the NDCs, the commitments that countries are bringing in terms of how they're going to meet those um, climate targets out of Paris. And it's very visible in those spaces that this is happening. We can see it in legislation coming out of countries where they're looking to deal with issues like plastic waste and pollution. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a recognition of the role it can play in, in solving those big challenges. Right. Ross, it's a delight to talk to you. Thank you very much for taking the time out for us today. Thank you. All right, we now have Rosemary there on the west coast of Canada. I'm so thrilled that we get to spend a little bit of time talking to each other today on your incredible research um, that I've been following for a long time, Rosemary. So great to be able to say hello and thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me here. You're so welcome. So you're the project director of the Share Reuse Repair Initiative. Can you talk a little bit about the organization and the work that you've been trying to do communicating and talking about circularity? Sure, we're a, a Canadian charity and our mission is to create a, a vibrant sharing, reuse and repair sector. 
um, that's a meaningful waste and climate solution, but also enables people to live circular lives and have circular livelihoods. And so right now we're bringing three tools to Canada that are linked to circular communication. And one is called the Lighter Living Motivations, which we heard a bit about yesterday, inspired by Citrus Smart Consumption Profiles and co-presented with One Earth. And these are seeking to meet people where they're at by speaking to their natural motivations that drive their choices. Another one is called the SHIFT program. We piloted this year based on the SHIFT framework developed by Citra for UBC's Dr. Kate White. And it distills global best practices into five factors that are proven to shift behavior in uh, eco-conscious directions. And then finally, I'm not going to say much about it. It's very new, but in collaboration with Alice Labs and Circular Citizen, together with Canadian Tire, we have a new one publicly announced today called Stuff and Flux Chapter 2. And that's going to be really digging into what's in the hearts and minds of leading edge consumers both to support messaging, but also to look at what it means for future-proofed, you know, circular innovation in a post-COVID world. What does that mean, leading consumers? Yeah, leading edge consumers are kind of the, the you know, 10% of the population that shape markets. They're not overly radical, but they're, they're, uh, they're experts in newness. So we want to pay attention to them. Okay, so you're trying to influence influential consumers so that they can then shift other people toward a more circular approach? No, we want to understand them so uh -huh. we can see what that strategically means um, for where consumer goods innovation, you know, should go. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll definitely be following up on that. I hadn't heard of that before. Thank you. What have been a few of the things that you have uh, understood, learned about, worked on in, in recent years that have been sort of ahas for you in terms of your understanding of the meaning of circularity? Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about what we've our ahas from applying some of these tools, uh, if you don't mind. So the oh, lighter living motivations have kind of actually shown us that the tent is bigger than we think. More people are making circular choices in their daily lives other than for saving the planet. In fact, in BC, for two thirds of the people, the things that motivate them are not primarily about the planet. You know, they're about need and practicality. Um, uh, style, uh, saving money, um, comfort, pleasure, tradition, all sorts of other things. So we, if we can reach those diverse motivations, we actually have the potential to mainstream behavior, to which I think is really exciting. And the second thing is that the SHIFT program has shown us that there is actually no one size fits all message. We need to really dig down to understand people, their motivations in a very specific way, but also the barriers and benefits to behavior change, and then really jump in and test messaging and figure out what works because the messaging can be quite nuanced um, and that can make a big difference in terms of uptake or not. Yeah. When you say figuring out what works, do you mean what messages lead to actions or do you need what, what messaging leads to understanding? What are you, what are you trying to tease out there? Well, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, but we're certainly, you know, for example, in British Columbia, we have seven of these motivation groups for BC. And two of those are consciously motivated by environmental concerns. So how do we get those folks to step up and do, a, and do more of what they're already doing. So we need to really speak to the, the fullness of what motivates them. Um, so one of them, which you know, I think some of the folks in this room will be, is called Healthy Life and Planet. It's like 14% of the BC population, and they are absolutely motivated by environmental concerns, but also by personal health and wellness. And they're the folks that really dig into the details and do the detailed research. And so if we want them to both understand and take more circular actions, we actually need to use messages that have facts and speak both to positive environmental and health and wellness benefits and impacts. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, of how we would reach them okay. and encourage them to do more. 
Lots of people already are using reusable bags, moving away from plastic, thinking about containers. They're going ahead and repairing things, uh, cutting down on travel. That's been a big focus of conversation for the last, well, with COVID, of course, but prior to COVID, people were starting to make those choices, plant-based meals, um, Vancouver, the 100-mile diet, so on. How do we motivate people who already care about environmental issues to take another step and then I guess to also communicate to other like to tell people what they're doing because folks don't want to be preachy but they also do want to try to affect change so how do you help that yeah I mean I think there are motivations here of these motivation groups that like to be advocates and in fact the one I just mentioned healthy life and planet well those are the folks that like to be advocates and so we can take a look and understand the two motivations in BC that are overtly planet motivated. One's called healthy life and planet, the other one's called eco trends. And you actually reach them in different ways. So eco trends, they like to make conscious choices, but they're also into what's in style and what's trendy. Uh, they tend to not have as much time. So in fact, you wanna use kind of higher level messages with them um, that talk to what's trendy and stylish. Um, and uh, make sure that you emphasize that it doesn't have to take them too much time. So they, they, these guys actually like stories more than facts. So there you go. But I think the important thing is, if we want to mainstream lighter living actions, we also want to reach the, fact, the folks for whom the planet is not their primary motivation. Yeah. So let's make sure that we get them don't overlook them and reach them effectively. So the one I love in BC is called Waste Not Want Not. This is a significant 22% of the population. And they actually have a lot of circular behaviors, but not for green reasons. So they like to purchase and use only what they need, get rid of anything extra. When they shop, they're motivated by the best deal. So let's reach them in ways that, that speak to their motivations, facts that emphasize how circular choices meet their needs to be frugal, minimalism, avoid waste. You can use that zero waste term absolutely the, with them. But we also want to ensure that environmental benefits are actually secondary in the messaging. And that's important. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Eh? You have to kind of embed it. The, the goodness comes underneath the first message. Um, that's right. What about the folks who have no interest in this whatsoever? How do you get to them? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you need to kind of make strategic choices. One of them is called shop style and social. And these folks just love to shop for the pleasure of it, for the sake of it. Um, budget's not necessarily an issue and they do it because they feel that's what society expects of them. But, you know, we've pulled out five opportunities that they could that we could use to get them to use lighter living. Let's tap into digital trends. Let's make it high quality and, and fashionable. And those can be the folks that we can seek to, um, you know, the, the high quality, high end circular products and services are things that they might enjoy. Okay. It does take a bit of creativity. <laughs> Sounds like it. Well, we could talk all day, but I'm going to um, wrap it there. Thank you so much, Rosemary. So good to, to talk to you. And it sounds like you've got some challenge ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for having here, me here. And I'm excited to hear the other speakers today. Thank you. That was so fascinating. I really, you said it, I really could talk about that all day. Yeah, I know. Have to, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> what, what are those, what's underneath those words? Let's learn more about that. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah those were uh, both fascinating interviews. Uh, I wanted to add in a few points from everyone watching out there as well. Uh, there was one that I loved from Alice Henry. I think an important starting point in communications is acknowledging that everyone is already doing something circular. It's just a different term. Uh, and that really resonates uh, with me. You know, we don't always have to use the words even circular economy or get the whole package of what that is across, uh, but we can connect it with what people are already doing. And then I saw a number of comments and themes in here around language. So 
stripping out the jargon, how to get the right language, making sure, and we heard uh, this from Rosemary, that we have those targeted messages for all different audiences and that they need to be very uh, precise and surgical, but using language that people use in everyday uh, life. So those uh, were a couple of comments that stood out. And the last one I think I'll bring up was uh, a great question about how as communicators, and we saw there were a, a big group of communicators out there today, how we hold uh, businesses to account when this term is used for greenwashing. And as circular economy, uh, we, as we see this crescendo in interest and the term taking off and the concept becoming more mainstream, it also means that it will be used both yeah. authentically and sometimes inauthentically. So how, as communicators, can we uh, play a role in making sure that it's used to its best purpose? Oh, that's such an important point because people have become so cynical about messaging. And so they want to sort of understand that if you're telling them something, it actually has meaning underneath it. Not that they're not going to question you, because they will, but that there's something that holding it up and then there's something good or reasonable that comes from truth that, that sits underneath. All right, you've got some uh, work ahead of you with a couple of interviews. I do. So I'm for my two interviews today, I have the pleasure of connecting with Megan Arnault, who is leading Eileen Fisher's Renew program that connects customers with clothes that are ready for their second or third lives. And I'll also be speaking with Marina Testino, an influencer with a circular economy message. It sounds like it's going to be a really interesting conversation and I'm looking forward to our chat about it afterwards. For those of you watching, please continue to engage with us on the chat. Um, it's my turn to follow along with the online conversation, and we're going to try to knit some of this back into this conversation with Alice Irene. But right now, it's over to you. Great. Thanks, Catherine. And, uh Great, and that was a great segue to knit this into our conversation and start talking about fashion. So welcome, Megan. It's so great to connect with you today. Uh, we're really pleased to hear from you uh, while you represent US-based clothing retailer Eileen Fisher. So welcome, Megan. So Eileen Fisher is widely viewed as an innovator in the sustainable fashion industry. Uh, Definitely, that's how I how I know of uh, your company and and respect that work. So I'd love to hear from you if you could explain the ecosystem of an Eileen Fisher garment. Absolutely, thank you, and thank you, Alice Irene, and thanks to WCEF for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, in this really important uh, dialogue uh, today. I'm very excited to carry on the conversation. Um, I will just start, I guess, with an, uh, an outline of how we um, have embraced the responsibility for the full life cycle of each garment that we produce as a company through uh, sourcing and supply chain transparency, we work to choose the most uh, sustainable fibers we can, creating clothes centered around quality, function, uh, longevity. And then when those clothes are no longer being worn, we ask you to bring them back and then we can channel them into their next use streams, uh, moving high quality garments uh, in good condition into resale through our Renew stores. And those damaged beyond repair head into our Waste No More program. Uh, we consider that a bit of an innovation lab for scalable solutions for textile waste. Uh, so we are committed to evolving these practices. Um, it's not just about doing no harm, but to truly transform the choices that our consumers have when they're shopping. Thanks, Megan. That uh, really resonates with, with me. You're speaking my language here, and there's so much in there uh, that uh, I'm excited about. I'd love to hear, you know, I understand that you encourage your your customers to consume less, to purchase less as, as a company as well. You mentioned high quality garments that last longer versus volume. Uh, so can you speak a little bit about how you're guiding your customers to consume less and how does that work from a business perspective and a messaging perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's such an important question for businesses to um, wrap their arms around. Um, so we do invite our customers to follow us toward more sustainable practices. Um, you know, it's not just about uh, uh, consuming less. It's about uh, it's about uh, interrupting the take 
make and waste model of consumption um, that we're also accustomed to. So uh, if we're able to take folks behind the label and to explore uh, the efforts that we're invested in and, and the hurdles that do exist in creating those sustainable products, we do believe our customers and our employees are seeing value that we're running business in a different way. Um, as uh, Rosemary, I think so aptly said, you know, uh, there are so many uh, other motivations that folks have to participate in the circular use cycles. Um, it's not just about um, uh, it, it's not just about uh, the planet. It's, it's about pleasure. You know, people are engaged in uh, consumption based on on very base needs, and so when we are bringing joyful experiences to them and helping them to make better choices based on better products. Um, and better life cycles for those products, then we consider ourselves in, in moving the dial uh, and, and, and involving more people into the, that cycle of use and reuse. Interesting. I like that emphasis on joy and, uh, you know, you mentioned sort of pulling back the curtain a bit and explaining to your customers through messages what you are doing. Can you talk a little bit about that, that process? Like how do you explain those hurdles? How do you bring people into this journey and why you've decided to be circular? Yeah, you know, uh, you mentioned at the very outset of, of this conversation, the, the, need for storytelling and how um, how engaging people with stories is really key to having people invest emotionally in in circular economy. I think that's important. We are, at the end of the day, human beings. And um, I think when we can connect folks to um, the stories of supply chains, for example, right, where our products are made and people understand the human connectivity, you know, to the processes which bring goods to them. Um, when we reconnect people to those processes and tell the stories behind how cotton is grown or uh, who knit that sweater, we are really uh, helping people to fully embrace and give value to the systems that support the products we consume, which in turn, I think, helps people make better choices about the products they consume um, when we're following it through. And we're quite transparent, I'd say, with the work and the challenges that go into um, investing in those types of supply chains, in drawing out those stories um, to be told and shared. And, and I think it really does help to, to shift people's perceptions. That's such a beautiful and I think effective shift, you know, from going this this idea of companies hiding what they're doing to being very transparent and showing it, and that speaks to people's desire for authenticity and to know what's happening with uh, the the stuff that we interact with. Uh, I'd love to hear about your experience across both, let's call it regular and resale retail, and what you've learned about customer experience. So do you find differences in behaviors across these different markets? Are people coming at it from different motivations? Honestly, I think the similarities are, are much more valuable to explore in uh, some sense. Um, you know, when we're inviting people to participate in new models of consumption, we need to remember uh, we're focusing on the gratification and reward that participation brings. Um, so through Renew, which is our resale program, uh, Eileen Fisher has a unique opportunity to elevate and change the perception of buying used for customers who previously shunned that as a possibility. Uh, in doing so, um, you, we can invite other brands um, by by showcasing our success here. We can invite other brands to engage in the same kind of business to consumer resale model, um, and then it gives us greater control as a brand over that brand value and expression. So, um, I I do think it's important, and I'll go back to this point um, away from shaming consumer behavior behavior. Um, and towards supporting that joyful participation in circular consumption, uh, we need to start shifting uh, the onus away from, from that customer choice 
um, because if we're waiting for the tipping point of her uh, choice uh, to change our uh, behaviors in terms of how we are producing and selling um, goods, um, we're just extending the, the length of time it's going to take us to get there. So we really do have to give our customers better choices and uh, create spaces to engage them truly in the circular economy um, with clarity and, and, and honest storytelling. Like you said, authenticity. Wonderful. That makes a lot of sense uh, to me, Megan, and we know we don't have that time to wait uh, and so that we do have to make those changes and offer those choices. So that's, uh, and, and this emphasis on joyful participation is, is really beautiful and that's something we hear a lot. So uh, thank you very much for that, Megan. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the conversation. Me too. Marina, hello. Thank you for joining us. We're so thrilled to have you. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you here, but I have to say I just love your purple uh, suit. And I'm very familiar with it from Instagram, so it's uh, great to see it uh, here somewhat in, in the flesh, I guess. Uh, so for everyone out there, this is Marina Testino, the founder and creative director of Point Off View, a micro agency focused on digital communication and sustainable transformation. Welcome, Marina. It's uh, really great uh, to have you. So I want to hear a little bit more about uh, this micro agency focused on uh, digital communication and what you're doing. Uh, but first, the thing that I'm most interested to dig in with is uh, you calling yourself an artivist. So I'd love to hear what do you mean by that? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you're wearing right now and how that links uh, to your identity as an artivist. Um, yeah, so when I started into the fashion industry, I really wanted to be, get a message out there that was more around conscious consumerism and sustainability. And I felt activism was very aggressive and not very welcoming, or at least I didn't feel like an activist. Um, and I felt like, why not use arts to be an activist? Why not show through images, through, through, through arts, through concepts um, and ideas, um, showcase and educate people around how to be more conscious and what are the problems out there? And, and I had this word of artivism and really instead of focusing on the problems, focus on the solutions. And instead of being like, you're doing this wrong, it's like, look, this is what you could be doing. These are the solutions that are out there and, and really focus on the positive side of being an activist and not on, on all the negative side that a lot of people focus on. That makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, so often, even in today's conversation, we've underrepresented the power of images and art and different media and mediums uh, to tell the story and to get messages across. It's not always words. Uh, and your, your images do that so effectively. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about uh, a couple of these campaigns that you've had, including the one right now? Like, How, how do you uh, bring this to life? Um, so I wanted to showcase how to be more sustainable, but being colorful, being fashionable, being sexy, not having all these connotations that five years ago sustainability meant brown, black, white, breaks, like you don't look pretty and you live in a farm. <laughs> so I really wanted to bring that conversation to the fashion industry and showcase it through color. Um, so I created a series of campaigns to showcase that um, and really instead I think we might have uh, lost Marina there for a minute so we'll just see if we can get her back uh, but great well definitely uh, a lot there oh I think you're Hi, Marina. Uh, Welcome back. Did you lose me? Yes, but you're back. Sorry. Oh, we've all been okay. there about a thousand times in the last year, so no worries. Um, um, where did I leave? 
Uh, I think we are hearing a little bit about you bringing you know this into the fashion uh, world and what I liked about that is you're sort of using the medium of fashion to uh, actually make a statement so you're using the very thing that you're uh, talking about as a medium for for your messages uh, we might have a bit of a a tech issue yeah. here though uh, I don't know, Catherine, if you had anything that uh, struck you from that. It's just such a, a wonderful, um, vivid image, right, to turn from browns and blacks and sort of dull gray to color and just sort of shifting and how powerful that is for people to think about it in a different way. It's something that's really come up in the questions on Slido as well. People are saying, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to get their head around a circular economy conversation or hard to get their head around a, a conversation that says you can't do that anymore. So flip, flipping it around and saying, here's what you can do. You can still enjoy yourself. You can still have all the things, but we're just going to um, change what's underneath those things and invite you to, to make different choices with what you purchase and how you wear things and how you go about your, your time in the world. Right, and it links back to those motivations. Like if someone isn't motivated by planet as their number one or they don't want to do it in a certain way, like to Marina's point, you know, wear neutral, slow fashion items or that's not accessible to most people, that there is a way to do it, uh, you know, our own way. And I think uh, the campaign that Marina, and just let us know if you're back there, uh, that the campaign that she's doing right now which uh, builds on past campaigns is wearing uh, one outfit for a month, as I understand it, in all different ways, right? To talk about consumption and fashion at the same time. Yeah, it's an important message. Just um, something that uh, we heard yesterday from the minister from Rwanda, and she was talking about how um, just the things that we choose, um, what we want, and what we need are very different things and sort of moving much more toward what we need and then using things in a good way so that um, we're not taking up too much space or um, overarching. I do believe we have our Marina back with us. We were just talking about your trend-setting idea of sh wearing a suit for a period of time. So I'll hand it back now to Alice Irene and you can tell us a little bit about your idea that I'm sure a lot of the fashion snobs <laughs> were um, kind of looking at you thinking, what is she doing? Maybe you want to expand on this. Um, yeah, so the idea of this campaign is called One Dress to Press, and it means what it means. Like really wearing something for a period of time that you feel comfortable in and that um, you feel empowered in and that you're going to wear, you can accessorize differently, and you don't feel that pressure of the industry of being on trend, of being on the new color, of wearing what everyone's wearing, and really feel yourself. And this campaign started like four years ago with a red suit, and I actually did it for two months. <laughs> and this year I'm doing it with purple, because um, purple is a color of feminism, and I really wanted to also empower women throughout this activation. And I'm doing it for one month, and it will be all through Fashion Month. So I'm going, I did New York Fashion Week, and I'll do London and Paris. And other campaigns that I've done, uh, always with colors, so I did one with yellow, and it was called Yellow Like a Lemon. So I wore all yellow outfits for two months, head to toe, <laughs> um, and launched during Paris Fashion Week. So it was different rented pieces, borrowed pieces, sustainable brands, secondary market. And it was really a campaign to showcase that sustainability doesn't need to be dull, that there's so many options, that it doesn't mean you have a lot of money and you can buy sustainable brands. Borrow from your friends, from your family, go rent pieces, go buy secondhand. There's so many options. And through my campaigns, I try to look for a problem and all the solutions. And and make it easy for people to understand. And it's more of a challenge. I'm like, get a challenge, try to wear all, like be a conscious consumer, try to rent, try to buy sustainable brands, secondary market, or borrow pieces and, and make it fun. Thank you for that. That's uh, really interesting. And I think, uh, you know, you have an incredible audience that you speak to directly through social media. Uh, and I think, 
people often underestimate how much uh, consumers, I think, are coming along with circular economy in fashion more than I would argue almost any other space. And there are lots of exciting things uh, happening and so much uh, because of your work as well. So thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. We really enjoyed the conversation and looking forward to uh, carrying this on offline, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much. A woman after your a woman after your own heart. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But going in and seeking out what's the problem and then figuring out how to how to solve it. Right. And I loved how she said about her campaign, it means what it means. Like the name of the campaign and when we're talking about getting the message right, isn't that the heart of it, mean, it means what it means, like getting to it as, as quickly and directly and effectively for your audience as you can. Right. One of the things that's come up in a number of different ways in the chat from the audience is just how do you reach people who aren't really looking for this message um, or who are not participating in the conversation? Is there a way to kind of reach them without it seeming like that that's the foreground message? Can you embed it in other things? Absolutely, and I think that's where you talk about uh, you know things that people already value or that they're already doing by other words, and uh, not not feeling like we need to give everyone the whole story every time. But if somebody really cares about, for example, not wasting, which is really a message that works across many different types of people across the political spectrum, people don't like waste. And if you just talk about that, and that's what someone cares about, then that's a great way to bring in someone that maybe doesn't care about the you know the rest of the iceberg let's say right great to end on a simple pointed message thank you so much Thanks, really enjoyed Catherine. speaking with you today and um, over the last couple of days and I, I really hope we're our paths cross again soon Likewise, thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed um, watching this session now. Be sure to check out tomorrow's Accelerator sessions as well. There's going to be much more on how to get your message right, how to talk about circularity, and even how to champion circularity in your everyday life and choices.